How many of you, when, uh, when we said we're gonna play a game, we started calling on people, or we asked like, who wants to play? You were like, not me. How many of you were like, no, not me, not me. Right, that, that's just like our natural reaction when someone's like, all right, we're gonna pick people from the crowd. And you're like, oh. <laughs> we get this pit in our stomach, oh no. Uh, how many of you would, uh, would not want to trade places with me right now? Like you would not want to public speak. Right, that's one of uh, what's that's one of our worries is public speaking. We don't want to we don't want to be in front of people. Uh, so it's really funny the way that our bodies work. Uh, when like for example, like you just had this moment of stress probably, where when we said, "All right, we're going to call somebody up here," your body uh, created like cortisone and adrenaline and shot it through your bloodstream. So literally, you had like turbo fuel in your blood. And what it does is make your heart pump faster and you start going, and there's this, that's the bodily reaction to something like this that stresses you out. That's, that's what stress does. But worry, worry is something totally different. What worry is, is when you keep that stress going, you self choose to prolong that stress. So you're constantly pumping cortisone and adrenaline through your blood into your body, creating this reaction that you don't need to have because you're dwelling on something that doesn't have to be there. So uh, one of my worries is this, I'm going to share it with you. I had, uh, I had this amazing pair of pants. My wife said that I looked so good in them. And if she says that, I'm wearing those all the time, right? So I, I loved these pants. And the, the thing is they had one problem and it was a very humiliating problem, the zipper. The zipper would always come down on these pants. So I had this dilemma because my wife said I looked fantastic in these pants and I'd want to wear them because they're comfortable, they looked good, they felt nice. But I knew that if I wore these pants, the zipper was gonna come down. And so I, I would worry, I'd be in the morning, I'd be worrying like, should I wear the pants or not? Should I look good or not? Should I worry or not? And so I, I'd put the pants on because I wanted to look good for my wife. And then I'd go out in the day and I'd be having a conversation with somebody and I couldn't think about what I was talking with them about because I was worried about my zipper. Has anyone ever been worried about their zipper coming down? So then the stupidest thing is that I'd wear these on stage. So I would like, as I'm coming up, I'd check, I'd do the zipper check, you know, the quick zipper check. I'd do that thing. And then I'd get up here. And even though I did the zipper check, I'd like start in my message. And then I'd be thinking, is my zipper down right now? (laughs) Now here's the good thing. Like, even if your zipper goes down, you have insurance. It's called underwear. You should try it. It's fantastic stuff. It's really helpful. But th- th- this is one of my worries. That was one of the things that I worried about. Uh, we worry about a lot of things in life. And I, we're going to talk about worry today. And what I've been learning is that I worry a lot more than I thought. God has been teaching me this past week that I am a, a worrier, that I worry about things that I didn't even think about, that, that I didn't even realize I worry about. So worry goes a lot deeper than worrying about your zipper on your pants. We worry about our health. We worry about what if we get cancer? What if someone gets in an accident? We worry about different things like that, about managing our pain with the pills and all of these things health-wise that we have to worry about. There's a lot. There's a lot that we worry about within relationships. We worry about getting hurt. We worry about rejection. We worry about being accepted. We worry about these things in relationships. Kids, if, if you're going to school and you go out to recess, sometimes you worry about like, who am I going to play with this time? Is anyone going to want to play with me? That was was always my worry because they'd run away from me. Don't worry. I'm just like processing long lost pain right in front of you guys. Uh, Another thing we worry about is finances. We worry about our money and about not having enough. And what happens if we get to the end of the month and we've already gotten to the end of our money? This is real stuff that we worry about. And side effects of worry are crazy. Let me just read some of the side effects of worry to you. The side effects of continuing to worry, putting your body in this state of this turbo fuel in your blood, this cortisone pumping through you, side effects are fatigue, headaches, nausea, muscle tension, irritation. That's just where it starts. You also get to digestive disorders. You get to uh, heart attacks, 
depression, different sicknesses in your body, and then ultimately you can get to suicidal thoughts and ideation. This is what worry will do to us. Worry will put us into this state if we continue to worry. And we do this to ourselves all the time. So what do we do about worry? What are we supposed to do when we find ourselves worrying? How do we stop worrying? Because it's really easy to worry, isn't it? We find ourselves worrying more often than we would like to admit. So if you've ever experienced worry, anxiety, or fear, what Jesus tells us today in the Bible is for you and it's for me. Before we get to the Bible, let's pray. Jesus, we ask that you would reveal to us how we can deal with the things in our lives. God, help us to listen to your word and then help us to apply it. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Tell, tell your neighbor, I'm not worried. <laughs> I'm not worried. You're lying. Hey, before we uh, ask the ushers to come to receive today's tithes and offerings, uh, I just wanna tell you a few things about generosity, about why I give. Also, if you were here last week, you heard me mention that we were significantly low on budget last month. We, we brought in far less than we were planning to spend. And I, I wanna tell you first off that I'm not worried because we have a good God and we're talking about not worrying today. Second, I wanna share with you some reasons why I give. So here are a few reasons why I give. I give because our budget here at Life Center is designed to make the biggest impact for Jesus that we can both locally and globally. We have a financial council made up of church members who make sure that we're accountable with our money and that we're spending it wisely and well. And then what we do is we fund ministries here at Life Center and throughout the week. So it's like weekend services, kids ministry, youth ministry, Northwest Leadership College, all sorts of different things that we're funding to help people find and follow Jesus here. But we're also funding outside ministries. And one of those is called Project ID. Project ID, it, <laughs> woo! Project ID is a fantastic organization that serves some of the, the most underprivileged and underserved people in our community, the adult disabled, community. They do a fantastic job. My Ruta group and I went there a couple weeks ago and we had so much fun. We, we played bingo. We danced to Zumba. It was amazing. But we also talked about their Bible study that they do. We talked about what they're learning about Jesus and how they're following Jesus each and every day. And when we were talking with the director, she was sharing how this group is one of the most taken advantage of groups in our society. And so here's an organization that is serving them in Jesus' name, creating a safe place for them to come every night of the week so that they can find friends, so they can find community and find Jesus. And when you give to Life Center, you're also giving to Project ID and different organizations like that that are serving people in Jesus' name. So this is just one story of the impact of your generosity, but there's hundreds of others, hundreds of others in organizations and stories of people's lives. And so thank you for giving generously. What you give makes an impact and God multiplies your generosity. So I'm gonna invite the ushers to come to receive today's tithes and offerings. And I wanna thank you for giving generously and making a huge impact both locally and around the world. So if you'd grab your Bibles, everyone grab your Bible, pass it down the row, make sure you've either got one or you're sharing with a friend. And as the ushers are coming, we're gonna dive into today's passage. It's Luke 12, 22 through 26. Luke 12, 22 through 26 is on page 895. So a little context for you. This is a direct follow-up to last week's passage when Jesus is talking to a man who wants to get rich. Last week, this man came to Jesus, wanted to get rich, and Jesus tells him a story about a rich fool, a man who got incredibly rich but did the wrong thing with his money. He was rich towards himself but not rich towards God because he was full of greed. So Jesus gave a warning against greed, and this week Jesus is giving a warning against worry. He's helping us to see the damaging effects of worry, but also helping us to overcome worry in our lives. Jesus gives us not just a, a formula to overcome worry, but he gives us himself to overcome worry. And it's gonna be really, really helpful. It's been helpful for me as I've been studying it. So page 895, Luke 12, starting at verse 22, and we're gonna go through 26 and then take a pause. So Luke 12, 22. 
Then Jesus said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or about your body, what you'll wear, for life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens, they do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? So we're gonna pause there. Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, look guys, we just, we've been talking about money, we've been talking about your wants, but now I'm gonna to go to your needs. You don't need to worry about your needs. You don't need to worry about the things that, you, that are necessary in this life because I will provide for you. God will provide for you. Jesus says that in the previous passage, life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And in this passage, he says, life is more than food. Life is more than drink. Life is more than the clothes that you wear. And yet so often that's what we end up worrying about the most. We end up worrying about the next thing that we're going to, the next thing that we're gonna eat, the next clothes that we're gonna wear. These are simple worries that we worry about more than we should. And Jesus just calls it out directly and says, don't worry about this stuff. And then he moves to the ravens. The ravens were unclean birds in the Jewish society. So you wouldn't eat them. That means they were just birds that were of no use to the Jews. And Jesus says, look, these unclean birds, the birds that are of no use to you, God takes care of them. And how much more valuable are you? See, God takes care of the birds that have no value to you, but you are far more valuable than birds to God. So why wouldn't he take care of you as well? God is going to provide for your needs and your wants. That's what Jesus is saying here. So verse 25 and 26, Jesus says, look, by worrying, you cannot add an hour to your life. You can't do it. It's not possible to add an hour. Jesus is essentially saying, worry is a waste. Worry is a waste of our times. Worry is a waste of our energy. Worry is a waste of our thoughts. We waste so much on worry throughout the day and throughout the week. But not only that, not only is worry a waste, worry also paralyzes us. Worry stops our motion as we're trying to follow Jesus. Because what worry does is it takes the trust that we've given to God and it brings it back and says, I don't trust you with this. And we stop ourselves as we've been following Jesus. We halt our motion as we follow Jesus. And this is deadly for us. We do not want to do this. So when Jesus is talking about don't worry, I don't think that he's talking about uh, an anxiety disorder that comes from like your biochemistry, a, a, a mess up in your biochemistry. See, I have several friends who have taken medication for anti-anxiety pills uh, and they have alongside with prayer experienced a lot of help from this. So I don't think Jesus is talking about this. I think he's talking about our tendency to give into the type of worry that affects all of humanity, this general worry. See, worry sees a problem and says, what if? Like, well, what if this happens? And then we take that down the road to the worst thing that could happen. And we start worrying about that thing. We spend our time and our energy worrying and thinking about that when we don't even have to, it's probably not even going to happen. Worry says, what if? But faith sees a problem and says, but God. But God is bigger than this, but God is able to help me in this. And so instead of worrying about this problem, we just say, hey, but God is gonna take care of this. But God has me covered, but God has my back. So instead of worrying about problems and what ifs, we should strategize around who God is and what he can do. And we know that God is trustworthy, he's generous, he's loving, he's joyful, he's compassionate and he's powerful. God can do anything. And so when we worry and we think, what's gonna happen? We, we're, we're forgetting that God is on our side, that he wants to help us and he can do anything. One of the things that I worry about is following in my dad's footsteps. And, and when I think about having to lead uh, the staff here, having to preach every week, it's a little terrifying to be honest. And there's moments when, when I think, man, I really hope 
that I don't fail. Not for my sake, but I hope I don't fail because I don't wanna let you down. I don't wanna let Jesus down. I don't want to be the roadblock in what God wants to do in this church, in this city. I don't wanna be the reason that someone doesn't meet Jesus because I failed. And so I worry about that. And I, I go down this road and I think about the worst possible case scenario and I spend time and energy there and I forget to say, but God is on my side. But this is God's church, not mine. But God is here and he's powerful and he wants to move in this city. It's not up to me, it's up to God. And that's my worry if I'm totally honest with you. I worry that I will out preach my life, that I won't be able to live up to what I preach and the truth is, I won't be able to, right? Because I, I can't live this perfectly. I'm gonna try my best, but I'm gonna fall. I'm gonna fail. And I, instead of worrying about it, I just need to give it up to God and say, God, you know what? I trust you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna instead of worrying, allowing my decisions to be framed by my worry, I'm gonna allow my decisions to be propelled by what you can do and who you are. So I overcome that worry. So I overcome that problem and that obstacle Letting you be the reason that I do that. So point number one is this, don't worry, strategize. Don't worry, strategize. See, worry cannot fix your problems. Worry can't meet any of your needs, correct? It can't do that for you. Worry only poisons your mind and your soul. So I'm gonna give three biblical steps for how to strategize around who God is and what he can do in your life instead of allowing worry to frame your decision-making process. So the first step, the first biblical step to overcoming worry, to strategizing with Jesus is pray. Pray. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Do not be anxious or worried about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. See, instead of allowing worry to consume you, when you pray, all of a sudden God's peace fills you. When we pray, we invite God to partner with us in tackling our problems. So why have worry on your side when you can have Jesus on your side? Prayer invites Jesus in and kicks worry out. And I want to do more of that in my life. I wanna pray more often when I'm worrying and kick worry out and invite Jesus in. So that's the first step is pray. The second step is plan, plan. See, when, when, when we're trusting Jesus, we're partnering with him in what he wants to do. And so we need to come up with a plan and commit it to God. Proverbs 16, three says, commit to the Lord whatever you do and he will establish your plans. God expects us to make plans. He expects us to be wise and thoughtful and careful. And when we submit those to him, he will establish them. So while worry paralyzes us, God wants to thoughtfully mobilize our faith against our problems through planning. See, we need to make plans. And if you're worried and you, you're having a tough time making a plan, ask for help and someone can help you think through your problems and come up with a plan and then commit it to the Lord and he will establish it. So first pray and then plan. And then finally, play. Play. James 4, 17 says, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, it is sin. Again, worry paralyzes us, but when we've prayed and we've, when we've come up with a plan, oftentimes we, we, we sit with that plan and we don't hit the play button because we start worrying again, don't we? All of a sudden the worry that kicks in is the worry about what if this plan fails? <laughs> what if I don't do this right? And we allow worry to paralyze us from hitting the play button on our prayer and our plan. So don't let worry paralyze you. Hit the play button on your plan. Go through with it and do it. So if we pray it, plan it and play it, and then we fail, what happens? What happens if we do all these steps and we fail we know this, that God is faithful to provide it. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, look at the ravens. They don't plan, they don't pray, but God provides for them. And if we're doing this based on who God is, he is going to be faithful to provide for us. So we know when we pray it, God will hear it. We know when we when, when we plan it, God will establish it. And when we play it, we know that God will complete it. So the very last thing we need to do is worry. 
That's the very last thing you need to do when you're faced with a problem, when you're faced with a difficult situation, when you're faced with the trigger that's caused stressing in your life. The very last thing you need to do is worry. Kids, in, uh, in Bible, like Sunday school, in your, in your class, you've probably heard the story of David and Goliath, right? This is one of my favorite stories. And God's been reminding me of this story lately. So this story, here, here's basically what happens. Uh, David is a young man. He's taking care of the sheep and his father sends him to the battle lines because the Israelites are battling the Philistines. So David goes to the battle line to check on his brothers. And while he's there, he sees Goliath come out and challenge the Israelite army. Now, all of the Israelites, all of these tough soldiers, when Goliath comes out, what do they do? They run and hide. They're fearful. They're worried about what's going to happen. And so they all run and hide. And David sees this and he knows this isn't right. That worry is wrong in this situation. So he says, this should not be happening. I'm going to step up and do something about this. So first, we know that David was a man of prayer. All throughout the Psalms, most of the Psalms are written by David, these prayers to God. We know that David, while he was with the the sheep, he was praying all the time. And when a lion came, he defeated the lion with God's help. When a bear came, he defeated the bear with God's help. And so now when he sees this giant, he's already prayed up and he's ready to make a plan. So here's what David does. David goes to King Saul and says, look, dude, I got this. Not me, actually, but God has this and I'm going to do what he asked me to do. So David tries to put on Saul's armor and we know that that didn't fit, right? And so plan A, gone. (laughs) That's okay, make another plan. So he makes plan B. He takes his sling, gets five rocks from the river and then goes down into the valley to face Goliath. While he's down there, he talks to Goliath and Goliath says, who's this? You sent a dog to fight me? This a ruddy boy to fight me, Goliath? And David says, look, you may be big, but my God is bigger. You may be fearsome, but my God is fiercer. You may think that you have this in the bag, but you're already bagged. My God's got this. And so David has this plan, five rocks and a sling, and he starts running at Goliath. He hits the play button on his plan, starts running at Goliath, slings it, and hits David or Goliath where? In the forehead. And Goliath goes down and then David comes and chops off his head. I know, kind of graphic, but that's all right. It's in the Bible. (laughs) David prayed it, planned it, and played it. If you have giants in your life and you are paralyzed by worry, make strategies not framed by your worry and the worst possible case scenario. Make strategies based on who God is. Pray, plan, and then play. What resources and skills do you have that you can hand over to God and he can help you with it? Because David wasn't a warrior, he was a shepherd, but he took his shepherd sling and he defeated that giant. And God will do the same with you if you trust it into his hands. See, if I trust who God is and what he can do, what should my next steps be? That should be the question you ask when you start worrying. If I trust who God is and what he can do, what should my next step be? Play it, just do your plan and follow through because God will take care of you. Run at the giant in your life because your God is bigger. But how would this story be different if David was like the rest of the Israelites? He would have never become king, right? Because this was the turning point for David. All of a sudden, after he killed Goliath, they started singing about David. They said, Saul has killed his hundreds, but David has slain his thousands. They were projecting what David would do. This was the turning point for David. Maybe he wouldn't have become king if he hadn't have done this, if he hadn't trusted God in this moment. If he'd allowed worry to stop him, he wouldn't have become king. And I'm wondering if there's a turning point in your life based on your worry. And if you would trust it into God's hands, if you would face that giant and run forward at it, making that plan and hitting the play button with God, would that be the hinge in your story with Jesus? Would that change your direction and your destiny for where God wants to take you and what he has for you in your life if you would, allow, if you would stop allowing worry to paralyze you and start running at your giants? What if you spent more time praying, planning, and playing than you do worrying? I think our lives would be different. So Luke 12, 27 through 31, let's keep going because Jesus has more to say about this. He says this, consider how the wildflowers grow. 
do, they do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs after all such things. And your father knows that you need them. Did you hear that? He knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. See, Jesus gives two more examples here. We're going to pause there. Jesus gives two more examples of God's provision. So he gave the example of the ravens. Now he turns to the wildflowers and says, look, they don't labor or toil. They just grow beautifully because God is making them grow beautifully. That's what God does. He provides for them. He makes them beautiful. And he says, they don't labor or spin, but Solomon had to. See, they're dressed far more splendorously than Solomon. Solomon was worried about his clothes and his kingdom. He was building his own kingdom in his life. That's what Solomon was worried about. But Jesus says, look at the wildflowers. They don't do that, yet God takes care of them. God's taking care of them. And then he turns to the grass and says, look, the wildflowers are beautiful and they are the clothes for the grass. And the grass is here today and gone tomorrow. So if God clothes the grass in that way with the wildflowers that are far more splendorous than Solomon, the wildflowers don't have to do anything, the grass doesn't have to do anything, won't he take care of you? Why do you worry about it? You don't have to worry about these things because God has your back. And then Jesus says in verse 29, don't seek after these things. Don't set your heart on what you'll eat or what you'll drink. And then he says, don't worry about it. But it's really interesting because Jesus uses a different word here. All throughout, when he uses worry, he uses one word, but when he gets to here, he uses the Greek word meteorizomai. Meteorizomai. And this is a very interesting word because it's only used here once in the New Testament. But it's used in Greek literature in that day. It's used uh, in lots of different ways, but each of those different translations of this word works really well here. So I'm going to just... Uh, Let's think through this about what this word means and how it affects the uh, translation. So Jesus says in verse 29, I'm gonna read it to you again. Jesus says, and do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. And here it is, do not meteorizomai about it. Do not worry about it. And meteorizomai can be translated in these ways. Don't be caused to pant about it. Don't run out of breath chasing after these things and worrying about these things. And you know what one of the side effects of worry is? Shortness of breath. Here's another translation. Don't get hung up on these things. Don't get hung up about this. Don't allow these things to stop your motion as you're following Jesus. Another translation is don't get tossed in a storm. You get tossed back and forth of worrying about one thing and the next thing. It's like you're out on a high sea in a ship and you're getting tossed back and forth. Jesus says, don't allow that to happen as you're seeking these things, don't do that. Don't worry about it. And then the final translation is just fantastic. The final, it's so deep in meaning and significance. The final translation is this, don't suffer flatulence. (laughs) Jesus says, look, don't get, don't let your tummy get in a knot about this. Don't, don't allow it to affect your gastrointestinal system. Don't allow that to happen. And if we're honest, that can happen with worry. It can mess up our digestive system. And Jesus is saying, don't allow this to happen. Don't seek after those things. Don't set your heart on them because God will provide for your needs. In verse 30, he says, pagans seek after these things. The people who don't believe that there's a good God who's going to take care of them, who's going to provide for their needs, they seek after these things. But you don't need to do that because you have a God who provides for you. Believe that there's a Father in heaven who's looking out for your needs. Jesus is basically saying, chill, God has this. Your Father knows what you need and he's going to help you. And then in verse 31, Jesus shifts our focus. He says, instead of worrying about these things, instead of setting your heart on these things and being tossed at at sea, he says this, he says, but seek his kingdom and all of this will be added to you as well. Seek his kingdom. So point number two is this, don't worry, seek his kingdom. Don't worry about these things, Jesus says. Instead, you should seek the kingdom of heaven. Seek the kingdom of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, what's the kingdom? 
What is the kingdom of God? What does it look like? How do we know when we see it? How do we know when we're experiencing the kingdom of God? Well, let's look through the biblical context. Matthew 6, 10 says this, when we pray the Lord's prayer, this is the Lord's prayer. We say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus taught us to pray heaven down to earth. That's what God's kingdom is, is we're praying his rule and his reign down into earth. And so when you pray your kingdom come, you also have to pray my kingdom go. You're asking that his kingdom would be greater than your kingdom and your life. Luke 17, 21, Jesus says, nor of the kingdom of God, nor will people say here it is or there it is because the kingdom of God is in your midst or the kingdom of God is inside of you. See, God's kingdom, his rule and his reign starts in our heart when we submit all things to him, when we allow him to be the ruler and the authority in our life, when we grow a heart of obedience towards Jesus, that's his kingdom coming into our hearts. It starts inside out. And then finally, Romans 14, 17 says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Contextually in Romans, Paul is talking to the people about the rules and regulations about eating and drinking and and the Jewish rules. And he's saying, look, the kingdom of God is not about rules and regulations. The kingdom of God is about righteousness, about peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And if that's what the kingdom of God is about, I want more of that. Do you? I want more of his peace. I want more of his righteousness and his joy in my life. See, his kingdom is about peace, which is the very opposite of worry. So Jesus is saying, don't worry. Instead, seek my kingdom, seek peace in your life. So how do we seek his kingdom? How do we seek his kingdom? It all comes down, I believe, to what is the most important thing in your life. I get caught up all the time in things that are not important. Anyone else? Or is it just me? All the time, I I, I divert my attention to things that are secondary and tertiary, things that are not important at all. And I allow myself to get caught up in them and I start worrying about them because the things that are not important are temporary. They're transitory and they'll be here today and gone tomorrow. And when we worry about these things, we are, or when we value these things, we're setting ourselves up for worry. So what's most important in my life? Is it the King, Jesus and his kingdom? Is that the most important thing to me? You've heard the phrase that you are what you eat. And in the same way or similarly, what is most important to you is what you are building your life out of. You are what's important to you. You are building your life out of this material, this thing that is most important to you. So is it Jesus? Uh, One of my favorite stories as a kid was the three little pigs. My mom would read this story to me all the time and I loved it because bacon, right? (laughs) the three little pigs. And the story goes that there's three little pigs and they each choose a different material to build their house out of. And one chooses straw, which is not a good building material. Another chooses sticks, which if you're building a fort as a kid, yeah, I guess, but it's not a good thing for a house. And the other chooses bricks. Now that's a good building material, isn't it? So two of them choose inferior building material to make their house out of. Remember, what is most important to you is what you build your life out of. Are you choosing something inferior to build your life out of? Are you choosing something that is inferior to Jesus? And if it's anything except for Jesus, it's inferior. You're building with straw instead of bricks. See, if it's money, success, security, or relationships, or even health, these things are inferior to Jesus. If that's what you value most, that's what you're building your life out of. See, money's inferior to Jesus. Success is inferior to Jesus. Your savings account is inferior to Jesus. Your health even is inferior to Jesus. Don't value this the most. Value Jesus the most and you'll build your life out of him. So you can take my money and you can take my success, but you cannot take my Jesus. My savings and my friends may disappear, but my Jesus will never leave nor forsake me. My health will fail, but Jesus will not. He is my ever-present help. See, Jesus told a similar story to the three little pigs. He told the story of two guys who built their house. And one guy built his house on sand 
And when the wind and the waves came and the rain came, all of a sudden his house was washed away because he built his house on an inferior foundation. Another man built his house on the stone. And when the wind and the rain came, his house did not wash away. He was not buffeted by worry because he had built his house on the rock. And Jesus says, build your house on the rock. And that is the word of God. That is me. If you want to build your house out of the best material possible, it's valuing Jesus above all else. That's how you seek the kingdom. That's how you put Jesus first. That's how you seek the kingdom is by putting Jesus first. So whatever you do, in every situation, seek Jesus. Make him the most important thing in your life and you will be building your house on the rock. You'll be building your house out of bricks. And when troubles come, when the rain starts falling, you will not be, you will not be pushed back and forth by worry because you have planted your house on the rock. You've built your house out of brick and that big bad wolf can't blow you down no matter what because you built your house out of Jesus, amen. Luke 12, 32 through 34, let's finish this story. Jesus says this, he says, do not be afraid, little flock. This is loving language. Jesus is using the language of a shepherd for his miniature flock, his little flock. He's saying, I know each and every one of you. I value you incredibly. And he says to you and to me, this is what he says. He says, don't be afraid. Do not worry, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. So sell your possessions and give to the poor. Give to the poor, provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus says, don't be afraid. Don't worry. Don't allow these things in your life because God is pleased to give you his kingdom. God is pleased to hand you every good thing that he has. God is pleased to bring his rule and his authority in your life. God is pleased to bring his peace and his joy and his righteousness into your life. And because we are getting this kingdom, because we're inheriting all that God has, we can easily and gladly sell our possessions here and give to the poor. He's saying not to worry about anything it's that, so that we can practice incredible generosity in this life. Also, he tells us that by practicing incredible generosity, we are storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven. So what do you value more, treasures here or treasures there? Do you value your stuff here more than what you're going to get up there? And what if, like me, you have a problem with valuing your treasure here more than you value your treasure there? What if, like me, you find yourselves in times where you're holding on to things here tightly? What if you're like me and you worry about your treasure here instead of storing up treasure for yourself there? See, Jesus knows that we can get caught in worry about our treasures here. And so he tells us this, which is point number three. Don't worry, sell. Don't worry, sell. If you have a hard time valuing God's kingdom, start selling your kingdom, both literally and figuratively. Start selling the things that you value more than Jesus. Get rid of it, delete it, get it out of your life. Do whatever you have to do to value Jesus the most because our hearts get entangled in this life. And Jesus is saying, if your heart is entangled, take that thing that is entangling you, sell it and give the money to the poor. Get rid of whatever is stopping you from valuing me the most. Does it sound dramatic? It is. It is incredibly important that we do this because Jesus tells us where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And so if your treasure is here, you and your heart are going to end up where your treasure ends up. But if your treasure is in heaven, you and your heart will end up where your treasure is in heaven. In Matthew 19, 23 through 24, Jesus says, truly I tell you, it's hard for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. You guys, we are in the top 2% of the world. Everybody in this room is in the top 2% of the world as far as wealth goes. So 98% of the world looks up to us and says, you are rich. Jesus is talking to us. He said, it is hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And he repeats himself and he says, again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle 
than for someone who's rich, for you and for me to enter the kingdom of God. Why is that? Because we tend to value what's visible and temporary more than we value what's invisible and eternal. We value the things on this life more. And in fact, we value visibility. And the way that we value visibility leads to worry in our lives because what's visible is short-lived. What's visible will not be here forever, but what is invisible, what the kingdom that God is preparing for us, that is an eternal kingdom. And so we should value that more. See, just because something is most visible in your life does not mean that it's the most valuable thing in your life. And yet we treat it like it is. We often treat the most visible things in our lives like the most valuable things. Let me give you an example of it. It's way easier to spend money on your card than it is cash, right? Because you value the visibility of cash. You can see the value in the tens and the twenties. But when you swipe your card, you just think, oh, it's 20 bucks, who cares? And that's why we have so much credit card debt, right? Because we value what's visible and we, we don't value as much what is invisible. And the card is just this invisible endless money, right? That's what my parents taught me. Just kidding. It's just a joke, dad, calm down. <laughs> Matthew 13, 44, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all that he had and bought the field. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like this invisible thing that's hidden. But when a person finds it, he will gladly trade, sell all that he has so he can have this treasure, this hidden treasure. That's what Jesus says. Jesus says nothing is more valuable than him in our lives, than the king in our lives. He's worth everything you have and more. So if any possession is hindering you from coming to Jesus, sell it, give it away, get rid of it, delete it. If any relationship is getting in between you and Jesus and making Jesus less than the most important thing in your life, with love and grace, reprioritize your life. Make Jesus first in your life because he says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what do you value the most? What is your treasure? Are you sold out for Jesus? Are you all in for Jesus? Are you holding some chips back? Are you holding your treasure back or are you giving it all to Jesus and saying, look, Lord, I am all in, I'm sold out for you. It's not about my kingdom, it is about your kingdom. And I want to live all in for you because your kingdom is about peace and righteousness and joy. And I need more of those things in my life because my life right now is filled with worry. My life is filled with the things that I'm thinking about and concerned about and the things that I'm worried about. And instead, I wanna be filled with your joy and your peace. That's what his kingdom is about. And if you want that, then you need to go all in, be sold out for Jesus and seek him above all else. And if you value stuff here more, then you're gonna end up here. But if you value Jesus most, that's where you end up with Jesus. Here's the final story. The story of Martha and Mary. So Jesus comes to Martha and Mary's house. And when he does, Martha and Mary are so excited. Jesus is in their house. How many of you would be excited to have Jesus? How many of you would be like, hey, I need to clean up a little bit. And that's literally what Martha was thinking. And so Martha goes into the kitchen and Martha starts making the hors d'oeuvres and planning the main course. And she starts cleaning. She's like, oh, Jesus is here. But what does Mary do? Mary sits at Jesus' feet and listens to him. Mary just bees with Jesus. She just exists in Jesus' presence. And Martha comes to Jesus and says, look, Jesus, tell, tell that bum of a sister to get off of her bum and come and help me in the kitchen. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but there's only a few things that are needed. In fact, only one thing is needed and Mary has chosen that thing. Mary has chosen the better thing and it will not be taken away from her. Martha was worried and upset about many things and we would say rightfully so. She wanted to make it perfect for Jesus. She wanted to make it good for Jesus. And so often in our lives, we start building our own kingdom that starts copying Jesus' kingdom. We wanna make a kingdom that's good for Jesus. We wanna look presentable to Jesus. We wanna do the right things, but we're not actually with Jesus. 
And see, the kingdom of God is wherever the king is. And if you are building your kingdom apart from him, you're building a false kingdom. You're building your own kingdom. And Jesus says, look, Martha, stop building your own kingdom and start coming over here and be with me. Choose the better thing. See, there are a lot of good things in life, are there not? There's just so many good things in life, like your family and your friends and chips and salsa. So many good things in life. But Jesus says there's only one best. He says, don't worry about the rest. Choose the best thing. Just choose me. Choose to be in my presence. Choose to seek me and value me above all other things. And when you do that, you'll be saying goodbye to worry. You'll wave goodbye to anxiety and my peace will come into your heart. My joy will fill your life and you will exist in the kingdom, not just in heaven, but here and now. You'll experience heaven on earth when you make the king most important in your life. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we ask that you would help us to value you and seek you above all else. But we need your help, God. We need your help to kick out worry and to invite you in. We want you as our partner as we go through life. So God, help us to strategize based on who you are. Help us to trust you and know that you're with us, that you'll never leave us nor forsake us so that God, we can be free of worry and living in your peace and in your joy. God, help us to be those sort of people who are not worried and living out your kingdom in this world so we can represent you to this world that's watching. We pray this in Jesus' name and everyone said, Amen. Hey friends, if you need prayer, you can come right up here. There's the prayer team. And if you want to take a next step with Jesus, you can go in the back to the Welcome Center and they're going to help you take a next step. Thank you so much for being here. We'll see you next week.